If you can think of today's biggest actors, like you'd say Leonardo DiCaprio, Brad Pitt, Tom Hanks, Denzel Washington, or even Will Smith, Al Pacino, Humphrey Bogart surpassed them all in his prime and in his day. My name is Humphrey Bogart, in case of those of you in the audience who are either too young or too old know who I am. He was very popular, and at one time, at the height of his career, he was Hollywood's highest paying leading man. He was known for playing the bad guy roles and transitioned into being the hot rod lover with the cool personality that didn't have to do too much and the ladies would just swoon over him. As lovable as he was, he did have a dark side. He had a penchant for hitting women. Yeah, not so pleasant at all. As talented and as skilled and as mysterious as he was, he also had a penchant for having multiple affairs and just had a little dark side to him, which we're going to explore. But we're also going to explore his career because it was a very lucrative career and his tragic death and his romance with Lauren Bacall. But before we get into that first, hey friend, welcome to my channel, Crane Allude, where we deep dive and break down the most iconic stars through history. If you're not yet subscribed, please be sure to do so. And if you're already subscribed, please turn on your notification bell so you never miss an upload. Now, without further ado, let's get into this video. Let's start first with his childhood. Humphrey DeForest Bogart was born on Christmas Day, 1899, in New York City, the eldest child of Belmont DeForest Bogart and Maud Humphrey. And he grew up pretty wealthy. The exact date of his birthday has been a topic of debate. The exact date of his birth has been a topic of debate. Warner Bros. publicity departments once altered it to January 20th. 23rd, 1900 to make him seem more villainous, arguing that a man born on Christmas Day couldn't be as sinister as his on-screen persona. <laughs> like you can't be playing a bad boy on screen and your birthday is literally on Christmas, the happiest day on earth, right? However, state and federal census records from 1900 confirmed his actual birth date as December 25th, 1899. Bogart's parents were career focused and frequently fought, showing little emotional warmth towards their children. Maud, his mother, was pretty tough cookie. She was the one that wore the pants in the relationship. Maud insisted that her kids call her Maud instead of mother and physical affection was so rare. He was quoted as saying, I was brought up very unsentimentally but very straightforwardly. A kiss in our family was an event. Our mother and father didn't glug over my two sisters and me. When pleased, Maud would clap you on the shoulder almost the way a man does, end quote. As a boy, Bogart was teased for his curls, his tidiness, his cute photos, Photos his parents made him pose for, and even his first name. Despite these hardships, he inherited several traits from his father, a love for fishing, boating, and strong-willed women. Bogart attended the private Delancey School until the fifth grade before moving to the prestigious Trinity School. He was an indifferent, sullen student who showed no interest in extracurricular activities. Later, he attended Phillips Academy in Andover, Massachusetts, thanks to family connections. Although his parents hoped he would go on to Yale University, Bogart left Phillips in 1918 after just one semester. And despite the academy claiming he was part of the graduating class of 1920, he failed four out of six classes. Reasons for his departure included being expelled for throwing a headmaster into a rabbit pond, smoking, drinking, poor academic performance, and possibly making inappropriate comments to the staff. His parents were deeply disappointed by his failures to follow their plans. And when World War I began, Bogart seized the opportunity to escape his rut by enlisting in the United States Navy as a coxswain. For him, it was an adventure. He later recalled, at 18, war was great stuff. Paris, sexy French girls, hot damn, end quote. His classic images show him as streetwise, coarse, and rough-edged. But in fact, that couldn't be further from his real-life upbringing. Bogart actually came from a background with money. He was born on Christmas Day, 1899, in an affluent area of New York. My father was brought up well. His father was a doctor, and his mother, my grandmother, was an internationally known illustrator, Maud Humphrey. He grew up headstrong and rebellious. He was suspended from Phillips Academy in 1918 for what he called youthful high spirits. He then joined the Navy. His parents despaired of him, and eventually he drifted into theater work. He was a spoiled rich boy. He used family connections to get into uh, to start his career after the war. When Humphrey Bogart returned home after his naval service, he found his father in poor health, his medical practices struggling, and much of the family's wealth lost in bad timber investments. His time in the Navy had shaped his character and values, making him rebel against his family's way of life. Bogart became a liberal who disliked pretensions 
phonies, and snobs. He often defied conventional behavior and authority, yet was well-mannered, articulate, punctual, self-effacing, and standoffish. After his naval service, Bogart worked as a shipper and bond salesman, even joining the Coast Guard Reserve, and despite being raised to believe that acting was a lowly profession, he was drawn to the late hours and attention actors received. I was born to be indolent, and this was the softest of rackets, he said. Bogart spent much of his free time in speakeasies drinking heavily, and between 1922 and 1935, he began appearing in small acts on Broadway, not realizing this was just the beginning of his acting. Acting journey. Preferring to learn by doing, Bogart never took acting lessons. He was persistent, working steadily at his craft and appearing in at least 18 Broadway productions between 1922 and 1935, 11 of which were comedies. He played juveniles or romantic supporting roles in drawing room comedies. Try as he might, Humphrey Bogart couldn't break free from the typecasting that Hollywood had imposed on him. To his studio, he was destined to be a gangster and nothing more. The glamour and stardom he yearned for seemed perpetually out of reach. Bogart's professional life was grueling. With long hours and insane pace, at one point, he was churning out a film every two months. Despite his success, Warner Bros. showed little interest in making Humphrey Bogart a marquee name. They kept him in repetitive, physically demanding roles. Studios weren't air-conditioned at the time, and Bogart's tightly scheduled job at Warner Bros. was far from the peachy actor's life he had envisioned. Bogart disliked the roles chosen for him, but he worked steadily. In the first 34 pictures, he told journalist George Frazier, I was shot in 12, electrocuted or hanged in 8, and was a jailbird in 9. He was making a film every two months between 1936 and 1940, overworked and exhausted, sometimes juggling two projects at the same time. During these years, Bogart began developing his iconic film persona, a wounded, stoic, cynical, yet charming loner with a code of honor. The amenities at Warner Bros. were few compared to the prestigious Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer. Bogart thought Warner's wardrobe department was cheap and often wore his own suits on set. His only leading role during this period was in Dead End, where he played a gangster modeled after babyface Nelson. Bogart had a lifelong disdain for pretensions, phoniness, and was often irritated by the inferior quality of his films. He rarely watched his own movies and avoided premieres, issuing fake press releases about his private life to satisfy public curiosity. When he thought an actor, director, or studio had done something subpar, he spoke up publicly. He advised Robert Mitchum that the only way to survive in Hollywood was to be in a gangster. Consequently, Bogart was not the most popular of actors, and some in the Hollywood community shunned him to avoid trouble with studios. He really loathed being an actor. He thought it was sissy. It was not something you did if you were a man. <laughs> there were a lot of actors in New York that hated his guts. And I didn't know why for quite a while. And then I worked with him. And then I found out. He was not a very likable guy in Hollywood, and he'd be in a lot of trouble with other actors and stuff, but he was just very unhappy with his career and the trajectory that it was going. But things were looking up for Bogart. Bogart finally played his first romantic lead in Casablanca. Because his co-star Ingrid Bergman was taller than him, he had three-inch blocks attached to his shoes and some scenes. Casablanca won the Academy Award for Best Picture of the 16th Academy Awards in 1943. While Bogart was nominated for Best Actor in a Leading Role, he lost to Paul Lucas for his performance in Watch on the Rhine. However, the film catapulted Bogart from fourth place to first in the studio's roster, finally overtaking James Cagney. By 1946, he had more than doubled his annual salary to over 460000 and that was a lot during that era, making him the world's highest paid actor. The defining Bogart role followed two years later in 1943. It was to turn him into one of the greatest of screen icons. During production, there were no signs at all that the movie was headed for greatness. So it was a difficult film for him to do, but the main thing that the studios uh, had to deal with was the fact that they didn't think that he could get the girl. And uh, he had a very difficult time with Ingrid Bergman and dealing with that relationship and being a sex symbol because he was never thought of that way. You knew how much I loved you. How much I still loved you. The Bogart in himself is not a very romantic figure. He needs to have his romanticism, his attractiveness reflected in the actress who's playing opposite him. You get somebody like Bergman who just swoons when you put the camera on her. And there's interesting stuff going on there. But what about us? We'll always have Paris. We didn't have, we, we lost it until you came to Casablanca. I feel that he really rises to the occasion. It's really one of the great moments of his career. I've got a job to do too. 
Where I'm going, you can't follow. What I've got to do, you can't be any part of. Those are no good at being noble, but it doesn't take much to see that the problems of three little people don't amount to a hill of beans in this crazy world. No, no. He's looking at you, kid. I just wish I could have been in Ingrid Bergman's shoes in Casablanca. He was awesome, let's face it. Suddenly, he was acclaimed as one of the great screen actors of his time. But his attitude to stardom was ambiguous. His reputation was now greater than any other actor could measure up to. So he could afford to seem indifferent to it. I don't think he gave a damn about stardom. <laughs> I really don't think that concerned him a bit. I think he cared. What interested him was letting that on that he didn't. That was part of the Bogart facade. He cared very much. So he pretended he didn't. In terms of his relationship, in 1922, he met actress Helen Minken, and four years later, they tied the knot. The crazy thing is, she fell in love with him after he hit her on a movie set. He literally hit her unwarranted. That should have been the first red flag, but she was smitten. However, their marriage barely lasted a year, and Minkin's divorce filing painted a nasty picture, accusing Bogart of neglect and mistreatment, saying he valued his career above all else. She ended up getting her vengeance by having an affair on him, and once he found out, he divorced her. His frustration sometimes boiled over. In 1926, Bogart lost his temper and struck a fellow actress called Helen Minkin. As happens in all the worst scripts, they then fell in love. She was a big star, a bigger star than Bogie, and mm. people would say to him, you know, you're going to end up as the tail of the dog. And unhappily, it turned out to be pretty true. She had an affair, Bogey found out about it, and uh, they had a breakup. He treated her cruelly and told her he did not love her. He probably didn't. Her husband's temper was violent, and he struck her. And then, former husband of Helen Menken to wed actress. And quickly bouncing back, Bogart found another wife and actress Mary Phillips, but she didn't satisfy his quest for the one. Bogart's vices only intensified after he transitioned from Broadway to Hollywood. His close friendship with Spencer Tracy, who became his drinking buddy, didn't help. Bogart grew increasingly dissatisfied with his acting career in his second marriage. Unsurprisingly, his rocky marriage with Mary Phillips ended. Then he met his third wife. On paper, Mayo seemed like a dream. Beautiful and charismatic. When it came to drinking, Bogart had met his match, turning their relationship into a nightmare. In a distasteful move, Bogart blamed his previous failed marriages on his wife's demanding careers. And two years after marrying Mayo, she quit acting altogether, hoping it would save their marriage, and it didn't. So she let go of her career, which made her a little bit more depressed. Their marriage became notorious for all the wrong reasons. The press dubbed them the Battling Bogarts. Mayo gained a reputation for being physically aggressive when drunk, earning her the nickname Sluggy. In 1943, Bogart began fearing for his wife's well-being. After Mayo attempted to take her own life, Bogart desperately wanted her to see a psychiatrist. The distressing truth came out. Doctors diagnosed Mayo with paranoid schizophrenia. Fights were so intense that Mayo once stabbed Bogart in the shoulder, and during another altercation, they pummeled each other with heavy glass bottles. Their behavior spiraled out of control. Actress Gloria Stewart recalled a dinner party where Mayo dangerously handled a pistol and even threatened to take Bogart's life. Stewart also saw dark bruises on, May on Mayo's face, evidence that Bogart didn't hesitate to get physical when provoked. On one occasion, he reportedly ripped Mayo's dress right off her body. Mayo threw plants and crockery at him and even set their house on fire. And despite the chaos, Bogart remained in a toxic relationship saying, I like a jealous wife. We get on so well together because we don't have illusions about each other. I wouldn't give you two cents for a woman without a temper, end quote. So he loved the toxicity of it. He loved a good argument. He loved going back and forth. His relationships with women were as turbulent off screen as on. His second wife had left him and he married another actress, Mayo Mitho. But this time there was violence on both sides and not caused by Bogart's career frustrations. Outwardly, it may seem that everybody's having a good time and it's no big deal. Inwardly, it's not. I mean, inwardly, there's a lot of turmoil and a lot of problems. And, uh... And, and they would have killed each other. I mean, she stabbed him once, for gosh sakes. Studio publicists dubbed them the Battling Bogarts, trying vainly to portray them as a volatile but loving couple. My wife just missed me with an ashtray. I don't know what's wrong with her aim lately. Bogey once told me that the way she kept him was she got him drunk and kept him drunk. They drank together. And when they'd get drunk, they'd get hostile. He would say, every time she'd start to sing Embraceable You, he'd start to get out. Because he knew that she was going to get a gun or she was going to get something and come after him. 
But 43-year-old Bogart had no idea his life would be completely transformed by a 19-year-old girl named Lauren Bacall. Initially, Bacall wasn't thrilled about working with Bogart. In 1943, Bogart and Bacall found themselves cast in To Have and Have Not, sparking one of Hollywood's most controversial love affairs. As filming progressed, they grew closer. Usually serious and reserved, Bogart became uncharacteristically giggly around Bacall. Their growing chemistry even convinced the director to change the movie's ending. Originally, Bogart's character pursued another woman, but his red-hot connection with Bacall's character offered a better option. After their first on-screen kiss, Bogart asked Bacall for her phone number, which she wrote on the back of a matchbook. But this burgeoning romance posed a huge problem. Bogart was still married to the unstable male. To keep their affair secret, Bogart and Bacall went to extraordinary lengths, meeting under the cover of darkness in dark cars and poorly lit streets, doing work, breaks, and at the golf club. Bacall later recalled, from then on, I would get phone calls occasionally at 3 a.m. My mother used to say, where do you think you're going so early in the morning? That man, he's a married man. As time passed, their infatuation only intensified. Thanks to the success of To Have and Have Not, Bogart and Bacall reunited for the 1944 film The Big Sleep. At first, Bogart told Bacall he wanted to remain loyal to his wife and give her a second chance. But the undeniable chemistry between Bogart and Bacall made it clear that their goodbye was really just the beginning of a legendary love story. When it came to Bogart's devotion to his wife, Bacall later wrote, I said I'd have to respect his decision, but I didn't have to like it. Torn between two women, Bogart put Mayo and Bacall through the emotional ringer. His indecision became his greatest weakness. He played a painful game of leaving his wife and then running back to her. This had Bacall bouncing between hope and despair so much that she wept right before a scene, using ice to remedy her puffy eyes to look presentable. Bacall not only endured Bogart's indecisiveness, but also faced his wife's wrath. Luckily for Bacall, Bogart finally made up his mind. He decided to leave Mayo for good, and on May 10th, 1945, his divorce finally went through. Just 11 days later, he and Bacall married. It was an incredibly emotional day for Bogart, who cried through his vows. He was a loner. He was a lonely man, I think. And I think that was part of the problem. And when he got famous and when he started to really get big, he was in his late 30s. But there was still that loneliness there until he met my mother when he was 43. Bogart met his future fourth wife, Miss Betty Bacall, when she became his co-star. Anybody got a match? Thanks. I mean, it was her first movie. He's the movie star. They fall in love on screen. They have to change the movie because it's so obvious that he's going to get the girl. I mean, I think that I think that it was the stuff that dreams are made of. If you say, here's the greatest actor, highest paid actor of his time, and here's the sinewy, gorgeous 19-year-old model, and you get them together, and you use every cliche you could possibly use regarding that relationship. What'd you do that for? I'm wondering whether I'd like it. What's the decision? I don't know yet. He wanted me to be the kind of woman that he had always, I suppose, fantasized about and dreamed of. A woman who was, who behaved kind of like a man, who was as arrogant as a man, as tough as a man, and yet was a woman. Humphrey Bogart capitalized on the success of his pairing with Lauren Bacall by teaming up again for The Big Sleep. She was a sob, sob sister. Sob, sob sister. By now, his confidence as a romantic hero was so well-founded that every woman in the cast seemed to fall for him. Yes, her tears look like wine. Hello. Hello. But it was the electricity between Bogart and Bacall that gave the film its life. I like that. I'm a I like there was only one problem. Bogart was in love with Bacall, but still married to Mayo Mehta. I wanted to encourage him to believe that he could have a life because I had heard terrible stories about Mayo Mehta. And I had been warned that she might drop a lamp on my head and all this. And so he was filled with his own adult emotions while I was this infant. What's wrong with you? Nothing you can't fix. And in May 1945, Bogart did fix it. He divorced Mayo without anyone getting shot and 11 days later married an actress for the fourth time. He'd never had kind of a real married life. And, I mean, the first few years, we, we had the most wonderful time. Bogart had found real happiness, and for the first time in his life, it proved lasting. 
They traveled in Europe together and made two more movies. When Bogart found out he was going to be a father, he absolutely lost it on Bacall, leading to an upsetting shouting match. Bacall later confessed, it hadn't occurred to me that 48 year old, years old and childless, he wasn't ready to be a father. He kept yelling that he hadn't married me just to lose me to a baby, end quote. The very next day, he wrote her a long letter exposing his vulnerabilities. Bogart worried about being a bad father, but he also acknowledged Bacall's desire for motherhood and promised to come around to the idea. But fittingly, the couple named their first child Stephen after Bogart's character in To Have and Have Not. Two years later, in 1952, they welcomed another child, a daughter named Leslie. Nobody thought that the odd pairing of Bogart and Bacall would last. For 12 blissful years, the couple thrived. Bacall stepped away from acting to focus on raising her family. You see, every woman he has, he have them quit their jobs to focus on being a wife, etc. While Bogart snagged himself an Academy Award in the process. Mm. And then it all came crashing down. In 1956, Humphrey Bogart received a heartbreaking diagnosis, cancer of the esophagus. Though he underwent surgery, the illness had already taken root. Bacall nursed him as best she could, but it became increasingly clear that Bogart had no chance of survival. And he was hanging out with Spencer Tracy, Frank Sinatra, and the Rat Pack. And in the Rat Pack, they'd get into a lot of trouble. So they'd go to these nightclubs and do nothing but drink and smoke cigars. And he's even known to have gotten a little violent with girls. Bogart, there was always headlines of him being very aggressive with women, if you catch my drift. But he was popular, so he got away with a lot. And they were pretty generous, the tabloids, and how they reported on it. But women would come out and they just laugh it off like it was funny. Even in older documentaries with him, people would just casually stump over that and make it seem like it was nothing but the Rat Pack wasn't getting into anything good in that era. Bogart's reputation for hard living extended off screen as well as on with occasional justification. He and Bacall used to meet friends like Frank Sinatra, Angie Dickinson, David Niven and Joe Hyams at Romanov's restaurant where they founded the infamous drinking group the Rat Pack. He meets two young ladies. One of the women comes over and starts you know needling my father and wants to sit down and my father said, finally says you know get away from me he gets up and they get into a little match and she and he pushes her down because she's trying to come at him and he, he kind of fends her off and the next day uh bogey thrown out of el morocco a woman sues him somehow it was all too good to last in 1956 his constant drinking and smoking finally caught up with him it was obvious at the time that he didn't think he had cancer but that's what it turned out to be he didn't stop smoking he didn't stop drinking you know he would still have his cocktails he would still want his friends to come over i was aware that he was sick but i wasn't aware that he was dying and this is one of the problems never talked about death never wanted my mother to talk about death never allowed us to face the fact and to grieve for him until after he was gone on january the 14th 1957 aged 57 humphrey bogart died the funeral was held at all saints episcopal beverly hills all hollywood seemed to have turned out for it and the loss was devastating to Stephen and Lauren Bacall. He'd asked for his ashes to be scattered at sea, which really was his spiritual home. And unfortunately, on January 14, 1957, Humphrey Bogart's life ended far too soon. Humphrey Bogart's romance with Lauren Bacall is the stuff of Hollywood legends, but it was far from a fairy tale. Betrayals marred their love story on both sides. When Bogart laid on his deathbed, Bacall had already begun an affair with blue-eyed crooner Frank Sinatra. And I did a video for Frank Sinatra and Lauren Bacall. I put the Lauren Bacall one in the comment section. I'll pin it for you guys and in the end card. Check that out. But, uh, talk about shady. In fact, not long after Bogart's passing, she nearly married Sinatra. So the whole time he was sick, they were having an affair. And Sinatra was, quote-unquote, Bogart's really good friend. You would even say very close friend. But Bacall wasn't the only one who kept secrets. In 1982, a woman named Verita Thompson dropped a bombshell. She claimed to have been Bogart's secret lover for 17 years. Thompson started her career as an actress before pivoting to become a wig maker. Her first encounter with Bogart was unforgettable. At the time, Thompson was married and Bogart was still with Mayo. They spent the first night dancing and drinking into the wee hours, igniting a lengthy affair that couldn't have started at a more opportune time. With Thompson's husband away serving in the war, her Burbank resident became the perfect hideaway for the lovers. But there was one thing she never saw coming. During their respective divorces, Thompson decided to cut, cut contact with Bogart only to feel blindsided when her lover turned around and married Lauren Bacall. This didn't stop her from slipping back under the sheets with him. Their affair continued, often aboard Bogart's boat, the Santana. 
As a wig maker, Thompson was essential to Bogart, who wore a toupee, so she would fix up his toupees for him. That's why his hair looked so luscious until the very end. She even ended up on his permanent staff and was written into his personal agency contract. I worked on all but four of Bogie's last 18 pictures, she later said. Bogart had a sneaky way of hiding her in plain sight. He would invite Thompson to have dinner with his family at the house, believing that if his mistress acted like any other employee or regular friend, no one would be suspicious if they ever caught them together. Thompson admitted, I became more familiar with Bacall and the two children than I wanted to under the circumstances, end quote. Talk about betrayal. Oh, that is so trifling. Then in 1982, Verita Thompson finally penned her scandalous memoir, Bogey and Me, a love story. She even opened a New Orleans piano bar with the same name, but then Hurricane Katrina happened and yeah, so that was that. It's just crazy how Everyone in Hollywood always made the Lauren Bacall and Humphrey Bogart love story seem so magical and goals, couple goals, right? But behind the scenes, they were having affairs on each other. It was not that magical. And she literally, I mean, if he continued to leave, I don't think their marriage would have lasted. But in her mind, it did. And I love Lauren Bacall. I did a video for her. I actually do love her. But there was always an arrogance every time she talked about Mayo. She always talked about her like, oh, I heard bad things about her and she was going to do that. And I was the better woman. And he was who I wanted to be. He wanted me to be the kind of woman that he had always I suppose, fantasized about and dreamed of. A woman who was, who behaved kind of like a man, who was as arrogant as a man, as tough as a man, and yet was a woman. I wanted to encourage him to believe that he could have a life because I had heard terrible stories about Mayor Matho. And I had been warned that she might drop a lamp on my head and all this and so. He was filled with his own adult emotions while I was this infant. He'd never had kind of a real married life. And I mean, the first few years, we, we had the most wonderful time. Bogart had found real happiness, and for the first time in his life, he proved lasting. They traveled in Europe together and made two more movies. Yeah, it was always an arrogance of she was the better option, only for him to really have stepped out on you, because I do believe Thompson's story. She was, though there's not much photos of her out there, but it was recounted, and she was able to prove that she was around she was working for him she was around him all the time and he was known to have all these affairs and just for Lauren Bacall also to end up being with Frank Sinatra you know while he was on his deathbed so that was kind of like strange to me and that's all I have to say on this story this was the dark side of Humphrey Bogart one of Hollywood's biggest stars he was like the Brad Pitt of his era too but comment below who else would you guys like me to do a video for if you like the music you're listening to the link is in the description I love you guys so much thank you for tuning in until next time